And those are the questions. If you did not receive a ballot on your way in, there will be volunteers with ballots as you exit. Please grab one. This is eligible for the Audience Choice Award. Um, now I'm sure you have plenty of questions. Right there. So the question, in case you didn't hear it, was um, have you had further communication with Ayurele? And if you could give us an update on how his spirit is coming up. Sure. Well, um, you know, his detention all happened during post-production. And of course, then went back into production again. Um, so I was in New York uh, the day he was released. The craziest thing I think about the whole story is that, I mean, I talked to him on the phone. Like, you know, maybe around the time of that, that, the footage that you see, maybe within an hour or so, I found out that he was being released on Twitter. There started to be rumors before, you know, it was actually confirmed. And um, people started to say that they were texting with him, and that he texted back. Then someone said he called, and, they, and that way we picked up. So I just think the craziest thing is that I was able to call him on his same cell phone number, and he picked up. I and mean, the whole time I've known him, he's had the same cell phone. So I thought that was really crazy. Um, but, you know, he, for me, seeing the footage of him coming back, it, the question is, you know, you see that they have taken a big blow. I mean, they, they played their trump card, but what do you think is going to happen next? And that's the question that I have for, for everyone who sees the film. I've been in touch with him since then. I went back to Beijing as well. I think he's still very much processing everything that happened and trying to figure out how he can maneuver given these sort of, like, new set of circumstances and restrictions, um, and he's very much returning to art, you know, returning to speaking out. I mean, I think serving him that tax bill made him a little bit angry. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, he's, he's sort of coming out again, but um, it's different than it was before. And I think that that is the question, or one of the big questions of the film, you know, relating to Ai Weiwei is what, you know, what do you think is going to happen next? Clearly, they, you know, Dell's a strong hand, but I mean, everything you've seen in the last 90 minutes, you know, what do you think the future holds for, for Ai Weiwei? Right here. Hi. Um, it's amazing. I spent a lot of time in China. So I, um, I came in very, very curious as to how on earth you possibly could have filmed this. And so while I was watching, I, I was a asking myself questions about how were you getting the close-ups on what, what was going on? They obviously maybe didn't see the people back there, because how, how did you not get stopped, first of all, from filming what was going on? And second of all, how did you transmit that or get, save that? How did you get that back to the U.S.? So the question was, um, how did, in this situation, how did she get such, um, such coverage and, and, and video of him, and how did she actually get that out of the country and bring that back here? Question. Well, one thing I basically shot all the Verite stuff as a one-man crew. I mean, and I think that helps a lot um, to have him on a lavalier mic if, if he's willing to do it that day. And then I got like a sound man walking around picking up sound. Um, and you know, he that is it was almost I don't think it was ever the case that it was just me and him traveling. I mean, he's always got an entourage. He's probably got other people with cameras. Um, you know, there was the one trip where Evan was there, you know, maybe I'm the only person with them that's not Chinese. Um, but, you know, I think the main goal is just to stay under the radar. And I just think that nobody really had a sense. The same reason that Weiwei gets away with filming things, I don't know that anybody has a sense that, you know, you guys would be seeing this right now. I mean, I really think that's it. Um, I had a moment today just like, <laughs> you know, I can't believe, you know, this many people are here to see this. Um, and I think it's a little bit, you know, you staying off the radar and maybe a little bit of a lack of imagination of what the power of these images could be. Gentleman right there. Okay, this may be a totally stupid question, but uh, the Sunflower Seed Exhibition, they were, I saw them painting the seeds. Were all those seeds manufactured and paint, hand painted? So the question was, um, Sunflower Seeds, were all those uh, Sunflower Seeds manufactured and hand painted? 
They were. Um, they were made in Jingdezhen in Jiangxi province, which is basically like the emperor's kilns. You know, that is where you know imperial porcelain was made. They have very special clay in the ground and a long, long tradition of artisans who work in porcelain. I don't think anybody ever would have thought to make porcelain sunflower seeds. There's pretty much no reason for it. Uh, sunflower <laughs> seeds are cheap and they are abundant in China, but again, that was kind of part of the point. Um, and yeah, they basically, excuse me, worked until you know that was as many as they could make, and they filled the turbine hall with them. And then just kind of real quick, like the picture where the Shanghai studio is being demolished, and there's pictures of people holding their pictures of him, and there was another, was that another picture of him, or who was that person next to him? Um, were there two faces on these posters there on the other? Oh, that was, the, um, that was the musician, the rock musician, who tells the story about the night when Jerry was uh, beaten up. Um, uh, the guy who leans in real close, he's always wearing a hat. Mm -hmm. um, he's just a good friend of Weiwei's. He was part of the avant-garde art scene in the 90s um, and kind of a cult rock figure. He writes a lot of music for Weiwei's um, documentaries. And because he was also there that night when the police came to their hotel room, I think he was very affected by it. So um, they just made those posters, and he has fans as well. Right. Hi. Um, I just wondered, how did you get access to IWAY? Question. So the question was, how did she get access to IWAY? Sure. So I moved to China in 2006 um, after I graduated from college for basically no good reason, but I highly, you know, advocate for doing um, and I ended up staying, and I, I really did have a goal to maybe make a film, maybe do journalism. And in 2008, my roommate um, in Beijing, who's half Chinese American, um, it was curating a show of Weiwei's photographs. Those photographs we saw for the decade he spent in New York. And she'd been working on it for months. And I, mean, I, I saw these um, you know, contact sheets around the house. And it's a great entry point, I think, for someone like me. Maybe didn't know that much about him, but you see the New York and the basically every major Chinese cultural figure, you know, in their youth hanging out in New York. And um, she asked me if I wanted to do a video for the gallery because she thought it was a great story and they really didn't have any coverage for that. And I had the time and was underemployed and had to just bought a camera and that's really how it happened. And um, you know, that's how we met and I made that and he liked it and things kind of progressed from there. Sorry, just <clears throat> uh, here at Sundance, uh, documentary filmmakers have always been one of the primary focuses of the programming. In this documentary, it ends sort of with him challenging every artist has to defend freedom of expression. This is your work, but I would like to know how, in addition to this film, that challenge is heard by you as a documentary or as an artist. So the question was about um, artists uh, taking up the challenge to, um, sorry, um, how, how, in addition to the work, that challenge is affects her and what she will do. So taking up the challenge that he gives and um, how that is affected her as a filmmaker. Um, well, I definitely think that um, my biggest contribution to start is the film, and I can really that, um, I mean, this is our second screening, and I mean, I just felt like so many people came up after the first screening, and the takeaway message was very much one of inspiration and about, you know, and feeling implicated too, which is kind of what I wanted to do, and I think that's what, you know, Weiwei, I actually know that's what Weiwei thinks the power of this film can be as well, is, you know, not just raising his profile, but to understand the power of the individual voice. Um, and you know we do have an active online campaign, and you'll get some things when you walk out of here as well from our amazing volunteers who are waiting outside. Question right here. So I would like distributes online. How will you distribute this, and will Chinese people get to see this documentary? So the question was about distribution. Um, you know, how, how do you plan to distribute this, and if there's anything in the works? Sure. Well, I definitely know that this is. Um, or I, I feel it's a film of global importance, so it's not really just about distribution here, or it's not really about distribution. You know, it's important to think about the online experience as well. I think that is 
the answer, the question was the answer for how people are going to see it in China. I would have to say, I know that his fans um, on Twitter have known about this film. They, you know, a lot of people I, I do think know me by name, and, you know, we've been tweeting together for a while. Um, you know, however that gets out, you know, he has figured out a pretty good way to get things out in terms of downloading, because you really can't stream, and, and it wouldn't really work that way. They'd take it down, or the internet's too slow. And, um, so, you know, he kind of has his own ways. I'm really interested and hopeful about um, Hong Kong and Taiwan, though. I do think there may be possibilities for um, for real public screenings, and, you know, people would have to invite us and embrace us, and then we would gladly do it. In the center back. Was that the big white book he was holding he in his? He was holding up an iPad. I think oh, an he iPad. was following along like a like, TV, a, uh, like, like a little red book. Yeah. Gentlemen, we can. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. 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 I
Thank you, Allison. 